Um, when I was asked a few months ago whether I'd be happy to come and do the lecture, we were talking about a title, and we fixed on the title Responding to Conflict in the Middle East. And to say it's daunting is to put it mildly. Uh, but what I want to try and do is try and say something which might help make sense. And I think especially when we come to the discussion period later on, we'll be able to share it. I'm conscious, particularly with so many friends here, uh, that many of you will have direct experience of many parts of the Middle East. Some of you indeed are from the Middle East. And it's one of those occasions where you know that somebody like me trying to speak about a general, speak generally about something, will know that virtually anything I say, there'll be somebody, if not more, in the audience who will know more about it. Uh, so, you know, don't expect uh, sort of great words of synthesis. Uh, really, I just want to open things up. And I thought about perhaps the best thing to do was try and explain why there is actually a debate going on in Britain at the present time about whether the Royal Air Force should start extending its air war to Syria. Now, we're into the 15th year of conflict since 9-11, where it started in Afghanistan, and then two years later in Iraq, and we seem to be no nearer the end. And in a sense, what I want to try and do is tease this out a bit and, and see what the, the reasons are. Um, I'd like, if there's time, to go just a little bit further and put what has happened, particularly in relation to what is still called the War on Terror, into the wider context of the much bigger problems of international security and how we approach them. Uh, so I'll speak for about 40 minutes. Uh, the usual thing, if I go on much longer, the people in the front at least will get restless, uh, and I'll shut up and won't have the period of silence and then discussion among ourselves and more generally. I think we need probably to go back, um, curiously, to before 9-11. And if I was to single out a particular um, phrase almost, it would go actually back to 1993, what, 22 years ago. And in 1993, this was just after Bill Clinton had got elected, and essentially uh, he set up a new head of the CIA, uh, somebody by the name of um, James Woolsey. And Woolsey actually took the view that there were huge changes afoot in international security. And one of the senators actually asked him, um, Mr. Woolsey, how would you characterize the end of the Cold War? Uh, in terms of the changing security posture of the United States. And he said, uh, Senator, I would put it this way, we've slain the dragon, but we now live in a jungle inhabited by poisonous snakes. In other words, the Soviet Union had gone, being consigned to the dustbin of history. There was really just the free market system ahead, but there would be problems, and they had to guard against those problems. And in fact, in the 1990s, um, many of the big systems of war that were geared to the Cold War were actually sidelined. Uh, even the nuclear forces were cut back a lot. But what wasn't cut back was the ability to intervene in far-off places. So the US Marine Corps kept virtually all its personnel. The American Navy kept most of its huge carrier battle groups. The Air Force looked much more at long-range strike. Um, the Army looked more at its special forces. In other words, things were slimmed down, but directed against what they called unforeseen enemies. And that, in a sense, was the pattern through to the end of the 1990s. Right towards the end of the 90s, when the year 2000 election was coming up, there was a very clear movement within US politics, uh, which was usually accepted to use the term the neoconservatives. And they took the view that the 21st century would be the new American century because now the United States was, in a sense, the one superpower. But more than that, it was, in a sense, at the forefront of a very successful economic system, what we might call the free market or neoliberalism. And essentially, the United States had a duty, a real duty, uh, to bring civilization to the world in this kind of mold. Very similar to the attitude in Britain, say, in the 1890s, when we had Pax Britannica. We were bringing civilization to the world and the sun never set on the British Empire. So essentially, we really had this mission. Uh, a West African friend of mine once told me that the riposte in West Africa to that was the reason why the sun never set on the British Empire was, of course, because God didn't trust the British in the dark. 
Now, if you had actually tried to make a joke like that in 1890s London, you would have got blank faces. And similarly, if you'd suggested in the United States to the neoconservatives towards the end of the 1990s uh, that the idea that one state with 4 or 5% of the world's population had this leadership role of a particular sort, um, they would have really queried you because it seemed so obvious. And there was almost a kind of religious intensity, a real belief uh, that this was the way forward. And that, I think, is the context for 9-11 for and the American reaction to it. Now, just to remind you, this movement, Al-Qaeda, had actually been formed during the Soviet period of occupation of Afghanistan back in the 1980s. And in fact, in many ways, the, the Al-Qaeda leadership at the end of the 1980s had actually seen themselves as part of a group, the Mujahideen, backed by the CIA and others, that had actually got rid of a superpower. That actually crippled a superpower. And in that sense, as they formed this idea of creating a puritanical, very narrow element uh, of Islam, that this would actually be a renewing thing for that entire one of the great religions of the book. And they saw the need to expand worldwide, and you began to have that happening towards the end of the 1990s. And in many ways, the purpose of the 9-11 attack was actually twofold. One was to demonstrate to the wider Islamic world what this movement was capable of against the far enemy, the United States, with all its connections with Israel and the Gulf Sheikhdans and the rest. But the second element, almost certainly, was actually, in a sense, a provocation, a gigantic incitement uh, to bring the United States and its Western allies into Afghanistan. Because the belief was the Soviet Union being crippled, it being mired in the conflict, and that would also happen to Western countries. So in other words, the enemy comes to you. And so after 9-11, there was an expectation that in the following months, and don't forget winter was coming on, eventually the United States would intervene. It didn't do it that way. It used the Afghan Northern Alliance as its ground troops and used intense air war and the special forces. And the end result, therefore, was that within two or three months, the Taliban, who'd been, in the American view, hosting al-Qaeda, had gone and al-Qaeda had been dispersed. So even by December 2001, it looked like things were turning around. Now, the point about this is one has to remember what an absolute shock 9-11 was. Be under no illusion about that. It was far worse than Pearl Harbor because this was in the television age, in those symbols of power, the World Trade Center, and of course the Pentagon, the head of the world's most, the headquarters of the world's most powerful military. And essentially the shock was huge. And I think one has to say that it is very implausible to think that the Bush administration could act in any other way but to go to war. It may have been entirely the wrong thing to do. A few people argued at the time that what al-Qaeda did should be seen as an example of appalling mass criminality. And basically, to take them to war was what they wanted. But that, of course, was not in any way something which could strike a chord with the Bush administration, and so the war on terror started. And by January 2002, when George W. Bush gave his State of the Union address, uh, it looked like things were back almost going back to normal. But this was a speech in which he widened the war on terror way beyond al-Qaeda to the axis of evil, North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. And all the talk in Washington in 2002 was of going to war against the Saddam Hussein regime. And essentially, if you like, remaking the Middle East. This was when, of course, many people in many other parts of the world, notably across Europe, got far more concerned about the way it was going. There'd been a great deal of support for the United States, remember that, at the time of 9-11. I think it was Le Mans, the French newspaper, had its headline on September the 12th, we are all Americans now, we're with you. That dissipated in 2002. And so you then had the war in, Af in, in Afghanistan continuing at a very low level, and you had the termination of the Saddam Hussein regime in 2003. That again seemed to work incredibly quickly. In fact, in three weeks, the regime had more or less gone. And in perhaps one of the most significant speeches of that era, George W. Bush made his mission accomplished speech on the deck of the aircraft carrier, the Abraham Lincoln, on the 1st of May uh, 2003, when it looked like uh, things had been turned around and the new American century was back on track. Um, I remember, in fact, in one particular occasion, uh, talking to some people in Washington who were supporters of the Bush administration. 
and I pointed out that there were many people in Europe, uh, activists and others, who actually thought that what the United States was doing would actually be hugely counterproductive even to its own interests. One of them looked at me and said, you don't actually get it, Paul, do you? It's not really about Iraq. It's not really about Afghanistan. The real problem we have and have always had has been with Iran. And essentially, if we have Afghanistan safe with American forces there, Iraq safe with American bases there, with our allies helping us, Iran itself will be completely constrained. And the end result was things would really be back on track. But what we've seen instead has been a long-term reaction in both Afghanistan and Iraq. There isn't time in any sense to go into the detail of this, uh, but the outcomes have been really quite astonishing. If you look over the last, what, 14 years, um, the known death toll in the wars has been about a quarter of a million. The great majority have been civilians. Uh, if you look at what has happened in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and more recently in Syria, attempts to basically terminate regimes and replace them with something one's not quite sure about have been absolutely disastrous. Uh, yet at the same time, we are now talking about extending the war in Syria. Now, I think there's one thing here one has to appreciate, and that is what did happen to that Al-Qaeda idea? Where did it go? People have stopped talking, in a sense, about this movement in the last couple of years, and they've replaced it with the rise of this group variously called ISIL, ISIS, or Islamic State. And I think what would actually be very worthwhile trying to do is to actually ask how this happened. And I'll just spend four or five minutes doing this. Firstly, the Al-Qaeda movement was never really a hierarchical, structured organization. There was a kind of leadership, mainly centered around bin Laden and Zawahiri, initially in Afghanistan and then in Pakistan, but it was never something which was a narrowly organized entity. It was much more a kind of, well, coalition, loose association, franchise, call it what you will. If you think back to those times after 9-11, you'll remember that there were many different attacks in different parts of the world which seemed to be more or less disconnected but which were said to be part of the war on terror, part of the Al-Qaeda movement. Uh, we remember most notably 7-7 in London and the, uh, the attack on the Atocha Rail Terminus in Madrid. But think of the many others, the quadruple bombings of Western targets in Casablanca, the attack on the ancient synagogue in Gerber in northern, uh, nor northern Tunisia, where a number of German tourists were killed. Uh, you look at the attacks in Istanbul, two attacks on historic synagogues, and then a fortnight later, the bombing of the British consulate and the HSBC bank. In the consulate bomb, the consul and his personal assistant were both killed. If you look at the Sari nightclub in Bali, where 200 people died, normally, that light club was frequented by American service people on rest and recreation. That night, it was mostly Balinese and Australians, and the death toll was terrible. And so it goes on. In Jakarta, the Australian embassy and the uh, Marriott Hotel were bombed. Across the Middle East, there were bombings in Sinai, in Jordan, uh, down the Gulf Coast. Uh, there was the attempt to shoot down an Israeli tourist jet taking off from Mombasa Airport the bombing of the Paradise Hotel just north of Mombasa. All these were happening, but they were in a sense not organized centrally. But it demonstrated that in d individual countries, often with individual grievances, people fell behind this particular idea. But it seemed in a way to dissipate by about 2005, 2006. And it was sort of taken over in the public mind by what was beginning to become apparent in Iraq. And that essentially, I think, is the focus for what was to happen next. In Iraq itself, in a very complex war, which involved widespread resistance to occupation and also increasing interconfessional conflict between the Sunni minority who'd been in charge before and the Shia majority, you had within that a kind of offshoot of Al-Qaeda, <coughs> led by Zahawi, the, uh, the Jordanian, that actually formed almost the, the center of the most potent opposition to the American and also the British forces. And essentially, it was from that group that what we now know as Islamic State arose. 
Uh, there's a particular element of this which isn't widely known in the public eye, is actually very significant for the way wars are now being fought. Between about 2005 and 2008, uh, the Americans and their British associates and others found they were facing an insurgency which they could not control by these very dedicated people in central and northwest Iraq. They decided to approach it in a completely different and in many ways very tough and very brutal way. They assembled a series of elite special forces known under the con general term of Task Force 145 and they divided up the key parts of the insurgency into four task forces. To each of those was assigned a very elite, well-equipped special forces group. Uh, there were the, the Green Berries, there was the SEAL team, and the fourth of the, of the th four was actually a Sabre Squadron of the SAS. The British were involved very heavily in this. In a whole series of huge numbers of night raids, they basically were able to determine who the rebels were, and they detained, and to put it very politely, interrogated them and killed them. At least 4,000 were killed, and at least between 10 and 20,000 were detained, presumably for a very long period. From that group, you have the origins of Islamic State, ISIS. Many of the people who survived the attacks by the Western Special Forces carried on forming this group. And in fact, AQI, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, basically manifested itself eventually as Islamic State. Uh, when the Americans finally left Iraq, and remember Obama fought the 2008 election on the basis that Iraq had actually become the wrong war, when the fi Americans finally left in 2010, they basically released most of what they thought were the low-level prisoners and handed over the core of several thousand to the Iraqi government to detain, frankly, indefinitely. And so by four years ago, by 2011, as the Americans were withdrawing, you had a continuing underneath insurgency, which was now directed at the Shia majority government of, uh, 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 of basically composed of almost entirely of Shia politicians and uh, under Maliki. And you had essentially all these people in jail. And then you had the, the ending piece, the ending piece of AQI. What happened, and it wasn't really noticed in the West, was there was an extraordinary series of prison breaks in 2012 and 2013. And the great majority of all those prisoners, the core paramilitary elements that had fought the Americans and the British were broken out of jail. And they, in a sense, numbering several thousand, formed the paramilitary core of what we now call ISIS. There's one other crucial element, because one thing I haven't even mentioned so far is the Arab awakening. And essentially, this started in 2011, seemed to show great promise with the end of the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia, and then extraordinarily the Mubarak regime in, uh, in Egypt. In other parts of the Middle East, most notably in Syria, remember what were nonviolent protests were put down by the Assad regime with great force, and eventually that morphed into really bitter opposition, which involved radical Islamists getting in against the Assad regime. And essentially, from the latter part of 2011 onwards, over the last four years, what you've had is the development of an extremely potent movement, what we now call ISIS, which straddles the borders. And that is what is now being faced. And the Western states believe that this has to be controlled, and it can only be controlled by the use of force. And so we've seen an intensive air war, which has now been underway for something like, what, 14 months. The problem is huge because this movement is actually extremely robust. It currently controls territory of about six million people, probably more in fact. And it has robust sources of funding which include oil reserves, including taxes, include controls of smuggling and support from abroad as well. And it is actually competently run, brutal, but competently run. And this is because there are actually three elements within it. One is, particularly around the leadership, a kind of core of people who really are motivated by intense religious belief. It is eschatological. They look beyond this life. So the whole point is the timescales we're dealing with are completely different from anything that Western political analysts are normally used to. So in other words, for somebody like, well, in his day, um, bin Laden, 
Uh, he expected to die. He didn't expect to achieve a worldwide caliphate. That could take 100 years. And that is true of all the religious leadership. They're acting on a different time scale. But beyond that, you have this very strong paramilitary element, very bitter, very bitter against the current Iraqi government and very bitter against the Americans and the British and others for what was done in the control of Iraq four, five, six, eight or ten years ago. And then you have a third element which people forget, and those are basically technocratic, competent people. People who used to run many of the towns and cities and public works of Saddam-era Iraq. And they now are the ones who are running the towns and cities held by Islamic State. So what you have is a very strong sort of combination. And it's been very unexpected for many people, but it is there. Um, through my work, I sometimes get the opportunity to have reasonably good conversations with former senior people in the British Intelligence Service, people who've retired. And they take a very different view to what government is saying. They think this entity, Islamic State, cannot be defeated, and it's here for quite a long time, and has to be handled in a very different way. And this brings me, in a sense, to the final two elements that I want to talk about so that we have plenty of time for discussion. The first of this is the, essentially the aftermath of what we hoped so much would be the Arab awakening. And let me put it this way. At the time when it looked like there would be changes to more direct representative governance, it was recognized that if that was to happen, it would be a disaster for the Al-Qaeda type movement, which believed in radical violent overthrow of governments and their uh, replacement by a completely different entity, a very rigid kind of caliphate. If that happened, it has not happened by and large. And this means that they have another opportunity because they can turn around and say, the non-violent approach doesn't work, you just go back to repression. But even then, you've got to tease it out a little bit more, because if you take a country such as Tunisia, Tunisia is undergoing a steady, difficult but steady transition to democracy. It's much more democratic than it was. The Muslim Brotherhood linked to Ennahda party was in control for a couple of years, made a hash of it, they lost an election, they handed over power to a much more secular group of parties. But even so, in Tunisia, that as a country finds that more of its young men and some young women are going to join ISIS proportionate to the population than any other country across the region. Now, how could that be? A country which is making the transition is actually doing that. And the reason, almost certainly, is that Tunisia has formidable economic problems. It currently has a population of about 11 million, and it has 140,000 unemployed graduates. And while people are desperately wanting the new type of governance to succeed, it has the almost impossible job of satisfying high expectations for more sharing and a better life for more people. And that, in a sense, is one of the underlying issues that is missed right across the Middle East, and I dare say beyond, because although we're dealing in the case of ISIS with one particular movement, it's, this is in the background of a region which like much of the world, but perhaps more so than many parts of the world, has a very strong demographic bulge and has very large numbers of people are, who are marginalized and know they are marginalized. In other words, there's the concentration of wealth relatively in the hands of maybe 10% of a population, which means that more and more people know they're on the margins. And this is why you get all kinds of reactions, including on a small scale, people going and joining very extreme movements. I think that's, that's absolutely crucial as far as what is happening across the Middle East and beyond. I'd even say at this point that if we were in the position, um, let's say 30 years into the future, to look back on the present time and say just how significant was Al-Qaeda and ISIS, what did they mean for movements in the future, I would suggest it actually might be another movement which will be seen as being significant. And that was not a religious movement, but the neo-Maoist rising in India, the Naxalites, which are causing problems across nearly half the states of India. Because in a sense, what I think what is happening in the Middle East is part of is a much wider thing. In other words, there's the beginnings of a reaction from the margins in a world in which you have the combination of 
a neoliberal economic plan which is not delivering economic justice. More and more people are on the margins because of good improvements in education, people know it. And it's also a world which in the longer term is going to, in fact, is already facing major problems of environmental limitations, particularly climate change. So what I'd like to try and do to finish off is try and draw these threads together. As I said at the start, this is trying to look at a huge subject and trying to make some sense of it, no more than that. And I hope we can explore some of this in the discussion later on. If you look worldwide at the major trends which are determining a secure or an insecure world, we can get hung up on what's happening with Russia or China or Ukraine, or you can take a much longer term view. What I would argue is that it is the two really fundamental trends which are absolutely crucial. The fact that we are not getting an economically just world, and more and more people know it, and we're now facing a world which is seriously constrained environmentally. Now, this is nothing new as far as military thinking is, going, is concerned. I have the good fortune on occasions to speak at some of the defense colleges, talk through this kind of analysis, and you get lots and lots of nods of agreement because they can see the way that international security is going. I had one particular experience just two and a half years ago, which is almost in, or even more indicative. I was asked if I go down and speak, do an opening talk at a seminar, a one-day seminar at an Oxford college. They were going to be talking about uh, the security issues of weak and failing states in the coming decades and how they might affect British security. And they said they had a lot of experts covering different parts of the world who really knew their stuff, but they just wanted somebody who would give a bit of an overview about how overall trends were going. They wouldn't actually say precisely who the audience was, but it was an intriguing thing to go and do, and I thought there would probably be people from the Foreign Office. In fact, there were about 30 of them, and it represented the Commandant and all the senior officers of the SAS, <laughs> uh, with people from MI6, Defence Intelligence staff, and the rest. And they have these study days once or twice a year. They're actually funded by a private foundation. It's not taxpayer funded. And basically, these people, who are the elite of the army, actually get together to see what sort of problems they will face in the future. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, I went through the analysis quite briefly, and I tried to suggest at the end that if you're moving into a world which, in fact, is both constrained environmentally and divided, then you're going to get far more problems, but those problems have to be dealt with in terms of what's causing them, not trying to control the symptoms. And I actually suggested that, you know, if the SAS and others were called in to stabilize unstable countries and succeeded in their own particular way, this might even mean that we would actually pay less attention to look at the underlying causes. I don't know whether that got home, but what really struck me was the person who followed me. It was a very well-informed, intelligent analyst from Islamic Relief. And she was actually saying that their experience in this regard was particularly interesting. Now, Islamic Relief is not known as one of the big aid agencies as it is. It gets about 100 million a year. It's based in Birmingham, not London, but it's almost on a par with Christian aid in size. And she said that since it works across many of the world's semi-arid regions, she said that they get more reports from their field staff of the existing problems of climate change than just about anything else. She said, this isn't for the future, this is happening now. And it sort of reinforced the, the point I was trying to make. And I think, in a sense, the position we've moved into now is we're actually facing, and over the next five to ten years, the real choice about whether they believe you can actually maintain control where necessary by military means, or whether that is actually impossible to do. And you have to actually go underneath what is happening and look at the underlying causes. Um, the word that one can use for the way of doing it, traditionally, is lidism. You keep the lid on things. More technically, it's known as the control paradigm. And the significant thing, one of the most significant things about what is happening on the military side at present is the move away from the old means of control to another means of control. Namely, the use of very large numbers of troops 10, 20, 50 or so thousand troops actually based overseas, like in Iraq and Afghanistan, is really a thing of the past. It does not work. So what we've seen move over is what is known as remote warfare or remote control warfare. And essentially what it's about is use of special forces. We're expanding across the world, the use of armed drones, 
uh, the use of private military companies and other means to actually maintain control without a big footprint and often without very much debate. And this is happening very much at present. To come back to what we talked about earlier, over the last year, in fact over 14 months since the air war started, what has actually happened is the Americans reckon they've killed 15,000 ISIS supporters in the airstrikes. And they've conducted well over 10,000 raids. What the Russians have done this last week is a pimple compared with that. Yet, while doing that, um, the CIA reported just 10 days ago that in its last estimate a year ago, it estimated that about 15,000 people had gone from abroad to join ISIS. Their estimate now is 30,000. So in other words, in the year in which you have this air war to control it, it is actually expanding. And so this form of remote control, with all the drones, and Britain is using drones as much as its strike aircraft, actually isn't working. But the problem is, it's almost impossible to get a debate on this, to bring this out into the open. And what we're stuck with is a belief that you can solve things by military means, which is where we are at the present time. And the reality, as far as one can see, is that the whole issue of huge numbers of boots on the ground didn't work. It's known not to have worked. You move over to what you might call a combination of techno-fixes and remote control warfare, and that now is already being seen not to work, but there is no real questioning. One of the things which is incredibly difficult to get across at present is this phenomenon, ISIS, wants to be attacked. It actually wants war. They will be very pleased if Britain started bombing Syria. They're probably very pleased that the Russians are now bombing them because 2,000 Russian Muslims have already gone to join Islamic State. There are 16 million Muslims in, in Russia, and they'll be working very hard from Islamic State to actually get more of those people to come and join them. In other words, they want the provocation. This makes it incredibly difficult, frankly, for Western politicians to work out how to react instead. But what they're not able to do is to accept that the way they're going about it now is actually not the right way. Let me finish then just by saying a few words about what kind of approaches may be needed. Now, the first thing is if you're going to say anything at all about ISIS and how to limit it, um, there's no easy one way. Let's be clear about that, given where we are now. Also, it's probably a process that will take five to ten years. There are, though, some pointers. If it is an entity that wants war because that's what gives it support, be incredibly cautious about what you do. And if you assume you can crush it, you can't. Almost certainly you can't. Therefore, you've got to look at other things. One, obviously, is in areas where groups allied to ISIS are starting to expand, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in a number of parts of the world, anything that can be done to encourage governments in those countries not to repress but meet the underlying reasons why these groups are getting support is extremely important. There are hugely important reasons why we have considerable humanitarian relief for the nearly four million people in the refugee camps surrounding Syria. But it is still far too little. The humanitarian motive is the ultimate motive. But if you want to sell it to politicians, you want to point out to them that if people are left in dire states in refugee camps for many years, that will be a gift to ISIS and its recruiters. In other words, it, will be, it, will actually be, it is actually in the self-interest to help very much more than we're doing now. There are much better motives for doing that, but that is clear. As far as Syria is concerned, and this is where it gets tricky, in international relations terms, this is a real rarity. This is a double proxy war. You have at one level the Saudis and some of the Gulf state sheikhs backing many of the rebels. They, in turn, are supported by the French, the Americans, the British, and others. So you have two levels. But at the other side, as far as the Assad regime is concerned, it's actually backed by Iran, but beyond that, of course, Russia. Two levels of proxy. And they all have to come together, in a sense, to start making any kind of headway. Some good news, at least, is that the relationship between the United States and Iran, which is so crucial, is actually much improved, frankly, because of Rouhani and Obama and the nuclear deal. It's not out of the woods by a long shot, but relative to two years ago, there is a chance of those states talking seriously to each other officially. They're already doing it behind the scenes.
But essentially, if you look at it, it's going to be much more a question of preventing this entity getting bigger and actually using very robust diplomacy to actually so see some way to begin to bring it to an end. But it will not be quick. And then there's the much wider issue. If we're facing a world which is divided and constrained, then we have to meet those two problems systematically. Now, it's very easy to say that in a single sentence. But what we're really saying is we have to make, in a way, a transition economically to some kind of economic living which is perfectly long-term sustainable but has within it the capacity to actually make a better life for the majority of the world's people. That is incredibly difficult, but there's incredibly good thinking going on and quite a lot of practice as well. I mean, if you were to take particular examples, I think one of the most interesting pieces of work being done at present is the work of the New Economics Foundation, particularly its great transition project. It's doing something which has never been entertained before. It's constructing an econometric model of the British economy which feeds in environmental issues and finance bankers' behavior into the model. And it's designed to see how could you shift bit by bit the British economy to make it fairer and low carbon at the same time, maybe a 10-year program. And similar kinds of thinking are going on in many different parts of the world. There is an astonishing revolution, technolo technological, which we must accept in terms of far better use of energy, both in terms of conservation storage and indeed the use of renew renewable energy systems. The transformation on photovoltaics is quite breathtaking. They're so much more efficient than they were. And what I'm saying in a sense, there's no time to go into the detail. What I'm saying is in all kinds of ways, it is possible to envisage a world system which is fairer and sustainable. And there are huge amounts of efforts going on at present. There is not yet, by a long shot, the political will. And there is not yet wide enough political will to actually recognize that the kinds of economic policies which have evolved are not working and have got to change. And time is relatively short. But at the same time, it is possible. In some ways, I think the next what, five to ten years, and in fact some ways the last three or four years, represent the period of change. And I think there are reasons for optimism in spite of all the difficulties that we face. What is astonishing is how when people appreciate what needs to be done, it's remarkable how quickly people we act will act. And they will act much more effectively if the ideas and thinking about what we have to do are already there. Let me finish just with one phrase, there's one particular rather good definition of prophecy, and that is simply prophecy is suggesting the possible, suggesting the possible. And this is what we're in at present, both in terms <coughs> of turning away from the kinds of beliefs that military solutions are solutions, and also the wider issue of responding to these huge issues of a faltering economic system and one which is constrained. The more work which goes on into that kind of thinking, the better now. And I think there is at least a chance that if we have enough ideas there, as it becomes obvious we have to make the change, then in a sense it will be possible to do it. So in spite of what I've been trying to go over tonight, and despite of what we might want to discuss afterwards, I think there are always reasons for optimism. We do have extraordinary capabilities when the need is seen to be urgent. That may not be quite yet, but I think it's what we do now to actually do the thinking and prepare the way which is going to be crucial. If we can do that, then I think we have prospects which could be good in the future. I'll leave you with a personal thought. My wife and I have three grandchildren. There is Zoe, who is just six, Ben, who is four, and a young Charlotte, who is just a year old. All three of those grandchildren could well be alive in the 22nd century. They may be their late 80s and early 90s. And it would be nice to think that they, they could look back, not at the end of the century, but may, maybe by 2070, when they're in their 60s, and think it was the people who saw the need for change in the 2010s and 2020s which have ensured that the world we are living in is actually more peaceful. I remember about 40 years ago, we, we ran a conference over at Huddersfield Poly, where I was working as part of the human ecology team, on human ecology and world development. And we had an extraordinarily interesting politician 
by the name of Edwin Brooks, who'd been in Parliament, he had been the president of the Conservation Society, and he was the economic geographer. And he basically presented a paper, talk, about what could go wrong and what could be prevented. And he used a phrase which has stuck in my mind ever since. He said, what we've got to avoid, this is 40 years ago, is a crowded, glowering planet of massive inequalities of wealth, buttressed by stark force, yet endlessly threatened by desperate people in the global ghettos. That's what Edwin Brooke was saying 40 years ago. We're closer to that now, but I think maybe we're also beginning to be closer to realizing why it has to be prevented. If so, then I think there are grounds of hope. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.